Hello everyone, welcome to this tiny ML talk session. This is Carlos Hernandez Vaquero speaking from the local group in Germany. And today we have the great pleasure to have with us Thomas Elsken from the Boss Center for Artificial Intelligence. And we're going to talk about efficient multi-objective neural architecture search with evolutionary algorithms. Can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So we need to thank um, the TinyML talk sponsors um, that make possible that we bring these talks to you um, with ARM, DeepLight, Edge Impulse, Maxim Integrated, Kitsho, Reality AI, and Synsense. And there is still room for additional sponsors. Please contact Olga at tinyml.org if uh, there is interest. Um, there is um, for next week on Tuesday at 8 a.m. Pacific time, which is in Germany, um, five in the afternoon. We have the next TinyML talk. This one will be presented by the professor from Harvard University, Vijay Janapa, already. And uh, well, the topic uh, will be about TinyML Perf and ML Commons, uh, which is basically the first uh, benchmark for deep learning on embedded systems. So especially interested hardware and software vendors should look forward for, for this talk as uh, it will contain information on uh, how to generate submissions. Um, here in, in Germany, as you know, we have a local group of the tiny ML talks, and we are already over 200 members in, in Meetup. You see in the screen who are the, the local committee organizers, so we will try to bring the talks on time and interest uh, for you. We have um, Alexis Feinachta, I think he's not right now in the call, but he's a, a master's degree in control engineering, senior application engineer, and uh, he works for Infineon for the 32-bit microcontrollers for sensor fusion and control. The second is me, Carlos Hernandez Vaquero. I work as software project manager for AI and A IoT um, at Robert Bosch. And the next is Professor Dr. Daniel Mulagritzneda. Daniel, if you want to say hello. Oh, so hello from my side. I'm a professor at TU Munich, and then we also work on TinyML, and I'm very happy to be part of this. All right, thanks. Thanks to you, and of course you are welcome to either connect in, in LinkedIn or in the way you prefer uh, with us. We are actively searching for speakers as well for the next TinyML talk, so um, if you are interested or, so, or know of someone who would be interested, please uh, talk to us. This is a really um, exciting announcement for uh, less than, than two weeks. We have the TinyML Summit. And this is a free registration event, including over 50 presentations, a bunch of tutorials, awards, and really a, a lot of uh, interesting content. So feel free to, to go to this website to, to register or just uh, tinyml.org and you will find uh, simply how, how to connect, how to uh, register for the event. The tiny ML community started uh, approximately two years ago, and it was um, a small group, let's say small, 160 people in, in one room. But as you see, the numbers have uh, grown up really, really fast. And actually, the growth is basically exponential. And at the moment, uh, it's more than 4,000 people who uh, join any of the activities from the tiny ML uh, Foundation. You see in the screen at the moment the, the sponsors from the Tiny ML Summit. Uh, this is more than 25. Still, there is some time for uh, further sponsorship opportunities. If you would be interested, uh, you can contact uh, the email you see in the screen at the moment. So as you know, today's uh, presentation is from Thomas Elsken. Thomas is a research engineer at the Bosch Center for Artificial Intelligence, or BCAI, as we say internally at Bosch. He did his PhD um, with the Professor Dr. Frank Hutter from the University of Freiburg, and his research is in the area of uh, neural architecture search. Thomas is also the, the author of the quite famous survey about uh, neural architecture search with over 700 references in only uh, two years. So and actually, it's a really good way to, to get started if uh, you are interested in, in NAS to, to have a look at that survey because it's a really great introduction on the topic. And with this, Thomas, now the stage is yours. 
Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot for the introduction and thanks a lot for, for the invitation here. So today I want to talk about our recent work on yeah, efficient world architecture search. If you don't know what that means, I will explain it in a minute. And this is joint work with Jan and Frank. So maybe as a starting point, let's talk about deep learning in general. I guess most of you have heard about the lots of success stories in the recent years that deep learning had ha has had and here are just a very few very famous examples for example computer vision problems that are highly relevant for autonomous driving of course speech recognition which yeah everyone has in his pockets by now and then another example would be reasoning and games and there are of course many many success factors for for deep learning here um, for example the growth of data and the, the growth of in compute power but another another reason for the success is the are the advancements in uh, neural network architectures, um, which you can here see here from on the left, for example, um, which is showing the top one image net accuracy on the y axis and different neural network architectures on the x axis. And image net is one of we yeah, are probably the most famous image classification data set we have right now. You can see that um, yeah the performance really increased a lot over the last couple of years um, with new neural network architectures being proposed and as maybe also a lot of you know these neural network architecture while they were pretty simple in the beginning they became quite complex by now just to show you two examples i will show you alexnet here on the bottom left on in the next slide and also inception before to just have a comparison and so what you can see for alexnet is that it's actually a quite simple neural network at least we would say that nowadays um, where you just have some input and then you have a couple of layers like convolutions with different kernel sizes and a couple of density connected layers in the end. Um, if you compare that to Inception before, then well, on a high level, you might think that these architecture actually look kind of the same. But if you look a little bit closer into the details, um, then you can see that Inception before is composed of these Inception blocks A, B, and C, and two of them are illustrated here on the right. And here you can you you do realize that these blocks are actually quite complex and they have different types of convolutions. Uh, so for example, not just symmetric kernels, these, these blocks have different parallel paths, um, you have some merge operations and so on. And so these, these blocks are really complex graphs by now. And but if I would now ask you to kind of improve these blocks, then probably most people would have not really any ideas how you could do this. And I guess most people would also, well, you wouldn't really know if these blocks are optimal in, in whatever sense, or if you could actually try to improve them. Um, but as we have seen in deep learning yeah, research community in the last few years, actually a lot of researchers um, spent a lot of time on manually designing these neural network architectures and they try to come up with, with better architectures than what we've already seen before. And so what you can say is somewhat that while 10 or 20 years ago, people spent most of their time on designing features for machine learning models, um, well, this has been somewhat replaced by deep learning because with deep learning we just learn the features but now people they are not designing features anymore they are designing new network architectures so a somewhat reasonable question would be well if you can learn features from data why can't we also just learn neural network architectures also from data in the same way as we did with, with deep neural networks and features so and this this process of automatically learning neural network architectures from data without a lot of human intervention is what nowadays is typically referred to as neural architecture search. And that's the content of the today's talk. Oh, my slides are lagging a little bit. Yeah, okay. And so next I will give just a very brief introduction to neural architecture search or NAS in general so that we are all on the same page and that you get some, some basic knowledge here. And then in the, the next part of the talk, I will talk about some, some methods that we propose to and that kind of try to tackle some problems that um, you, you will have with like these very basic approaches. Okay, so let's get started. The first thing I want to talk about is, well, how do you actually write down a neural network architecture and what kind of neural network architectures would you would you optimize there? Yeah, so what, what's the space you are really looking for a solution? And the simplest thing you can think about is um, very much as what you saw in, for the AlexNet architecture is you just consider these 
super simple neural networks where you have an input and an output, and then you just sequentially stack some layers and yeah, different colors here in this illustration could be different layer types and so on. And then you kind of can write this down as a string in some sense. Yeah. Um, so a few things you observe here is that, um, well, this is somewhat a mixed optimization problem, so to say. Um, so first you you would need to choose a layer type, for example, yeah, so max pooling or convolution. Um, but then there are also hyperparameters that are coming with these layer types. Um, for example, the kernel size. So so you have like these these two choices already. And then another problem that, which is already showing up here is that well, for in this case of the convolution, for example, you have an additional hyperparameter, which is the number of filters. Um, and so this means the, these hyperparameters that that come with, a, with with the choice of a layer type, the, these hyperparameters actually depend on on the choice of the layer type. So, in in an, from an optimization perspective perspective, what you will have is some form of a, like a conditional parameter space that you're trying to optimize, um, which is quite tricky to do. Um, which is this comes somewhat comes on top of already having some form of categorical or discrete optimization problem. And of course, this is just a, the most simple example you can have. Of course, you could look into much more complex architectures as illustrated here on the right, um, where you have different parallel branches and your skip connection, and these, these layers split and merge at some point again. And um, here again, it's, it's it gets much more complex how you would actually write this down and well, how, what kind of optimizations methods you would use to, to optimize in the, in the space of neural networks, um, because by now, you are essentially trying to optimize the topology of the graph. Okay, so the last example for search space I want to show is um, this idea of having cells or blocks that you just use to compose your neural network architecture. Um, very, very commonly, what people do is they have two types of cells or blocks. Uh, one is called the normal cell and one is called the reduction cell. And the difference is that the normal cell preserves the spatial resolution and the reduction cell, on the other hand, uh, it reduces the spatial resolution. And then for, for building your neural network architecture, you would just stack these cells on top of each other to get the final architecture. And this will hopefully remind you of the example of inception before that I showed in the very beginning, where you, are, where you had a very similar pattern. Yeah, so these, these search spaces that people use in neural architecture search, they are very much inspired by what also human did before and how you would manually design these kind of architectures. Okay, but to conclude, if you want to kind of search for, for better neural network architectures, um, then you have this yeah, conditional, discrete, categorical optimization problem, and you're essentially trying trying to optimize the topology of a graph, um, which is not so straightforward to do, and which is not so trivial. So as a next step, I want to talk about what are actually the methods that are people using. And one very famous and very simple example is evolutionary algorithms. And the reason for that is that evolutionary algorithms are very complex, very powerful, but also very general um, yeah, optimization methods. And because they are so general, you could also use them to, to tune neural network architectures. So how would this look like? Well, in the context of evolution, um, these methods always work the same. So you start with some initial pool of candidates. So in, in this case, this would be some initial pool of neural network architectures. And then you would generate new architectures by applying some form of mutations to, to the candidates you already have. And you, when you're talking about neural network architectures, well, what are the kind of things that you could, could do to generate new architectures? You could do things as you add a layer or you throw a layer out, you could change the number of filters or any of these, these hyperparameters that come with the, with the layer types. Um, of course, you can also add skip connections and basically you can do whatever you want. And then you will have this iterative process, which is illustrated here on the right, where on the y-axis you have some, some time dimension, or you can also think about this as the number of iteration. And then on the y-axis, um, you can measure the performance of these neural networks you will be generating. And really each, each dot here, each point on this plot is, is a different neural network architecture. Yeah? And you, what you do is you train all these architectures and then you see what's their performance. And this you can somewhat use as a feedback or as a fitness function in the evolutionary algorithm. And here in this paper, they started with this, this super simple neural network here on the left, which is just input, then some pooling operation, and then an output. And you can see that over time, um, here are some, some of the more complex architectures that are generated by the method. Um, for example, here the segment that has these C plus BM plus R blocks, uh, which is convolution, batch norm, and relu. 
Um, so you add more and more layers and you add more and more structure to these networks until you, you converge at some point um, to, into some hopefully optimal solution. Of course, you can't, it's kind of hard to guarantee that you actually reach optimum, um, but you will converge to something quite good. Okay. So the second class of methods um, that are typically used is um, with reinforcement learning. And the, the idea is, is very similar, um, but instead of having these mutations, you have some reinforcement learning controller, which is kind of proposing new architectures to test. Yeah? So you have this controller. In this paper, for example, they use a recurrent neural network, um, which is generating the string. It's illustrated here on the bottom. This is somewhat presenting your neural network architecture. Then you would train it. and use the performance of the chain network as, as a feedback um, to update, then update the, the parameters of your of your controller via some reinforcement learning alg algorithm. Okay. Thomas, sorry, there is yeah. one question about the previous slide. Um, this is about the mutations. It's asking, um, what do you mean with that? Do you mean that the layers are changed somehow by themselves? Yeah, exactly. So, so, so just to be clear, this is not about um, you want to optimize the weights of a neural network, but you're actually changing the, the architecture of the neural network. So how many layers does it have? And what kind of layer does it have? Yeah? And mutations is here, you just choose some, some parent architecture, say this one from the very beginning here, and then you can randomly sample one of these mutation operations. And then, for example, you add another convolutional layer to this initial network. And by that, you generate a new network and that you can train again. Perfect, thanks. And please uh, put the questions in the Q&A if you don't mind instead of in the chat, thanks. Yeah. Okay, um, so these are, again, these are very general, very powerful approaches, but both have this, the same problem, which is that they train hundreds or thousands of neural network architecture, which are sampled and then they train it. And you can already imagine that this can be quite costly. And so for example, in this previous paper with reinforcement learning I mentioned, um, they actually trained almost 13,000 architectures and they did that on 800 GPUs for almost a month. And I would guess that probably most people in this call couldn't really afford to, to run this experiment. Um, and so the question is, uh, yeah, what, what do you do with this? Yeah. And also in this, this blog post from OpenAI, this, this method from the previous slide was actually ranked like the fourth most expensive deep learning papers from, from previous year, uh, right behind things such as AlphaGo and Alpha, Alpha Zero, yeah. Um, so while these methods are very powerful and they achieve pretty good performance, um, they are pretty much too expensive to run practice. Okay, and of course I somewhat cherry picked the, the last example and this is like the most extreme one, but also for some competitive approaches, um, you can see that the costs are still um, super high. Um, so for example, this Real et al. 2017 was the evolutionary algorithm from one of the previous slides. Yeah, okay. There is one more question, if I may interrupt you, Thomas. Uh, I think it was, again, from the previous slide. Um, how do we decide on the skip connections? Because including or excluding a skip connection changes the weights and biases again. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by they um, change the weights and biases. So of course, they, they will impact the training. And by that, they change the weights and biases, if that's what you mean. Um, but the idea is you really that you just keep it as simple as possible and you just randomly add them. Yeah? So you randomly choose some, some layer and then you randomly choose the second layer and then you add a script connection between these two layers. Yeah? And if that was a good idea, then you will notice that because the, the training performance of that network will be better than the network you had before because of the skip connection. Yeah? And if, if it's not better, then you will just discard it and you will not consider that option anymore. Okay, then I will go on again. Okay, so I think that these, these methods are kind of expensive and this is somewhat where we, are, where we started working on, on these approaches. And um, of course, um, the, the prim primary goal was how can we make these, these methods uh, yeah, much cheaper than what we have seen here. And again, the, the reason why these methods are so expensive is because um, they are just black box optimization methods, right? And by that, I mean, they, they don't really know anything about your problem yet. You just give something in, this, which is an architecture, and then you get something out, which is the performance. And then you're trying to, to improve your architecture, but they don't really leverage any information about neural networks. And that's kind of what, what we try to do in, in our work. 
And so the idea here is that, um, which is somewhat building up on network morphisms, is that you kind of try to reuse the weights of already trained networks. And so what, what's a network morphism? Say you have this network here on the left in the very beginning, and the key thing here is that it's already trained. So say this has like 90% performance on of whatever problem you want to have it. And then what you could now do is, in the context of evolution, for example, you would add another layer to generate this network here on the right. And so what these previous approaches now would do is, well, you just take this network and you reset all the weights and you train it from scratch. But actually, well, you'd already trained this network, right? So can't you just reuse these weights? Yeah. So what you would do is, for this first and the second layer that you already saw before, you can just reuse the weights. And then the question is, what do you do with this new layer? So you could just randomly initialize these weights, but then you would probably destroy the performance of this network. And instead, what you can do is, you just initialize this new network or this new layer to be an identity mapping. Then this means that, well, if this network has 90% performance, and then this network also has 90% performance, because by initialization, this network here on the right is just computing the same thing as the network on the left. Um, and so by that, you can somewhat warm start performance and of this newly generated network. And we try to kind of use the, this idea of these network morphisms in, in neural architecture search method to, to warm such a, the generation of new networks. Okay, so here's a somewhat detailed example, but it's also a very simple one. Um, how, how does this actually work? So say you start with this network N1, which is just super simple. You have an input X, then there's one convolution, one relu, and one softmax function. And now what you want to do is you want to add another redo conf log. So you want to generate this network N2, which is um, again starting convolution relu, but then there's another convolution and another relu before you go to the softmax. Okay, so first thing, now what you want to have is that N2 of X is the same as F1 of X, because if that's true for every X, then this also means that N2 has exactly the same performance as N1. So the question now is, how do you achieve this? Well, the first thing is, all the things that you didn't change, you just copy copy the weights. Um, so this means for, for this final softmax layer, W11 and W21, you, you copy the weights. And also for this very first convolution, you also just copy these weights. Um, so the question remains, what do you do with this part that you just added in the middle? Um, so one trick you can often do if you have some linear operation is then, well, you just choose the weights W22 so that this convolution is an identity mapping. Okay, now let's, let's look what we have. So let's start with N2. This is just the definition of N2. Um, now we can change the weights here because we, we copied them. So softmax W21 becomes softmax W11. And for the convolution here in the very end, it's the same. As an SSEC, we initialize the, the weights of this newly added convolution to be an identity mapping. So this convolution here in the middle just becomes an identity mapping. And then, well, what you would now ask is what happens from, with this relo of relo. Well, the good thing is relo, the relo function has the nice property that is idempotent, which means if you apply it twice, then it's just the same as applying it once. Um, so what you end up with is the submax w1 relo on conf. And this is in fact the same as this network n1. Yeah. So by by initializing n2 in a in a proper way, you have actually achieved that n2 ha, n2 has by initialization the same performance, the same properties as n1. Okay, and then Again, we, we use these, these network morphisms. Um, you can also extend this to, to many other cases, for example, to adding um, script connections, um, either by, by addition or by concatenation, um, for increasing the filter sizes and so on. All, all these operations that you would kind of typically consider when you would design a neural network, um, most of them you can just frame as a network morphism. And then we kind of use these network morphisms as mutations in, in the context of an evolutionary algorithm. Uh, or in a very simple uh, yeah, variant of this would be a very simple hill climbing algorithm. And so this is how, how the method would work. Say you have a current network, which has some performance of 82%, and the network architecture is here represented by these colored bars. So each color could be a different layer type, and then the, the height of the bars could be the number of filters or something. It's kind of arbitrary. Think about it, what, whatever you like. And then you would apply these network morphisms to generate new networks. So for example, for model one, uh, we increase the number of filters of, these, of the second blue bar here. 
or from model two, we added an additional layer here in the middle. And really, by, by definition of these network morphisms, all these network, they have, without any training, they have the same performance as the, the, the parent network. And what you then can do, rather than training them from scratch the whole time, you just fine tune them for, for a very few epochs or very few iterations. And because you, you added some layers, some capacity to these networks, we would hope that the performance of these networks improves. Um, so for example, model one could improve from 82% to, to 90% in this example. And then very greedy in the end, you just choose the, the best architecture um, and set it to be your, your current best architecture. And then you can just iterate this, this whole process. And at some point you can, you can stop now depending on what kind of constraints you have. So compute constraints or model size or something like this. Okay. And so here's a comparison of some of the methods. So here in, in right, uh, sorry, in, in red boxes, you can see the black box optimization methods either with reinforcement learning or with evolutionary algorithm that took like thousands of GPU days. And then here on the bottom, you can see our method that uses these network morphisms. And then there was also some concurrent work which uses network morphisms in combination with reinforcement learning. And you can see that these, these methods that use network morphisms and not, are not black box anymore, they are much more efficient than these methods we have seen before. To be fair, the, the performance is not as good as uh, with these previous methods, um, but I guess very often you would take this trade off for performance and um, compute costs to, to kind of um, yeah, do this. Here in the first block, you can also see some manually designed architectures, uh, and you can see that somewhat all these methods they are on power, or some of them even outperform um, what more the architectures of yeah that are manually designed would give you. There was one question, Thomas, um, about how do you decide what layers to apply to the network morphisms? Yeah. Yeah, um, that's a good question. So we do the, the most simplest thing, which is um, you just sample a layer uniformly at random and, uh, and you sample these, these network morphisms uniformly at random. Yeah, so we have like a set of mutations, which is like adding a layer, increasing the size of the layer or adding a script connection. And then you choose one of them at random and then you choose the position where you want to apply this also uniformly at random. Um, certainly that's, that's not the optimal thing to do. And you could also, yeah, try to somewhat optimize the way how you would choose these network morphisms or how you would choose the position where you would apply them. But we, we don't do any of these things. So. But there, there are certainly ways to, to improve on this. Yeah. Okay, thanks. There was one more um, about uh, how to handle um, the neural architecture search for massive nets, for example, the fission net, P8, or transformers. How do you uh, guarantee the optimality and reduce the search time. Uh -huh. Also, how, how to reduce yeah. the search dimension. Yeah, um, so you, you can't, can't, can never really guarantee optimality. Yeah, so um, that's also the reason why it's called neural architecture search, at least in my opinion. Um, it's really more a heuristic um, approach, and um, you're searching for a better solution. Um, but I haven't seen a lot of work on, um, yeah actually trying to to guarantee that you find the optimum yeah so this is i think it's very hard to to theoretically guarantee um because yeah it's just a very hard optimization problem and yeah so so you're just yeah the, the approach is you just let it run and you you stop at the point when you are happy with the performance you you get yeah okay okay yeah. what was the, what was the other part no i think you what already was, answered was it um, okay. I think you already answered it, Thomas. It's good. Thanks. Okay. Good. Good. Then let's move on. So this now is, brings me to like the follow-up paper. And if you again look at all the previous approaches, then you might have realized that all these approaches just optimize for a single objective, which is the performance of a neural network. And by performance, I really mean error rate or accuracy or so. But, but very often when you come from like a more practical field, maybe then you are not really interested in at the end of the day, um, running your deep learning architecture on some big GPU cluster with some big GPUs, but very often you're interested in the setting where you want to deploy your neural network on some embedded device on some microcontroller or something. And um, there, of course, your hardware is very different than from what you would find in a GPU cluster. And typically, you have a lot of constraints um, coming with this deployment scenario. So 
you also have like some constraints from memory size and so on. Uh, you probably want to have like some very good latency. Um, you want to reduce energy consumption and so on. And all, all these things are not really considered by, by the methods you've seen before. And typically what you would, would get is just uh, some super big architecture with millions of parameters. And that's that's probably not really, really helpful for your application. Yeah? Um, so we thought, well, can't we consider the, these, these constraints you have or these objectives, these other objectives you have for your specific application already during the design and the automated design of architectures? And so we really want to find not the architecture which has the, the maximum accuracy, but we want to find architectures that are really the best for, for some specific use case. Um, so the idea is that we extend the, the previous approach by not just optimizing for the accuracy, but rather we consider other objectives, um, as in this example, the number of parameters as some form of proxy for, for the hardware costs um, that you would have, or some, some proxy for how good would this fit on, on your hardware. And then rather than just having like this one best architecture, um, over the course of the method, you're actually optimizing and we are trying to find uh, like a set of neural network architecture that kind of trade off these, these um, different objectives you have. And so, if, for example, you can look at generation one here, this, which is this, this red curve in the plot of the method, then really like every, every edge, every corner here in the spot is a different neural network architecture. And here on the, on the top left, you would have the architecture which has the, the best validation error in generation one, but it's also the biggest architecture. And here on the bottom right of the red curve, you would have the, the smallest architecture, but it also has the, the worst validation performance with respect to, to the other architecture. And then instead of just having this one architecture that you try to improve over time, you would try to improve this disparity front over time. So really pushing it down to the bottom left corner and not just looking for better validation errors, but also looking for architectures that are more efficient in terms of number of parameters in, in this example. There is one really um, interesting question, yeah. Thomas. Um, how is accuracy relating to safety issues? Uh, how is accuracy relating to safety issues? Right. Um, yeah, I think that's hard to answer in general. Um, so if you're interested in, in the safety, then like one approach that you could go and where this method could be helpful is that you, you would need to frame safety also as an objective function in some way. Yeah? I, I don't know how you could do that. Um, maybe by, by means of some, some uncertainty measures um, in, in that sense, maybe, or maybe you also have some, some way of measuring safety. And then you could also use this as an objective in, in the method. But I guess accuracy in general, um, is, it's hard to relate that to safety. Yeah. Okay. And what does each generation represent? That's another question just came in. Yeah, so in, in each generation, you have a set of neural networks, say like five to 10 neural networks. Um, for example, you start with generation one, and then again, you would use this evolutionary algorithm. So you would choose neural networks from generation one. Yeah, so you have 10 networks, you choose one of them, you would generate new networks um, to generate the second generation. Um, so generation two has the older neural networks from generation one plus additionally generated ones. And then again, you would look at the straight off number of parameters versus validation accuracy, and you would choose the, the best networks um, with respect to the straight off. Um, so we would compute the parity front, which is somewhat giving you the straight off um, to kind of improve what you had in generation one. So in e each generation, you have a set of optim op optimal, in some sense, neural networks. Um, but I'll, I will explain this also more in, in the coming slides. So. Okay. But you can really think about this as it's somewhat the same method, but instead of having a single architecture, you have a set of architectures. And instead of optimizing a single objective function, which was accuracy before, you now have multiple objective functions that you're trying to optimize at the same time. Okay, and so this is really in a nutshell. Yeah, I'm probably repeating myself now. So you have some, some current population, which is a set of neural networks, say five to 10. Um, you would randomly sample some of them, then you would again randomly apply some mutation to them to generate new networks. And then you would ev evaluate all these newly generated networks um, with respect to all the objectives you have. So in this example, the objectives are number of parameters and the validation error. And then you would update your, your current population um, with the newly generated networks in, in case they improve your former solution. 
So there are some 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 nitpicks here. Um, well, okay. For, so first of all, the what he considers to be five to four to five objectives, and you're really optimizing them at the same time concurrently. And there's no scalarization or something like this going on. So you're really looking at all the objectives in a different dimension at the same time. Um, so then, some some interesting things here is that we noticed well. Actually, the objective function, they are very, very different in terms of how expensive is it to, to compute them. So for example, when you want to evaluate the accuracy of a neural network, then you need to train the neural network to do this. And then evaluating the accuracy becomes quite expensive. On the other hand, if you look at these objective functions, such as number of parameters or number of flops or latency, say, um, for this, you don't really need to find optimal weights, right? You, you can compute these, these properties, these objectives, solely based on the neural network architecture. These are completely independent of the weights. So you can actually compute these objectives very cheap. And so what we do is we kind of split up the objective function we have in, in cheap and expensive objectives. And the cheap objectives we evaluate much more often than the expensive objectives. And we use these cheap objectives to somewhat guide the, the process for, for sampling parents and for sampling mutations. Um, so that, yeah, with like very little cost, we have like a more densely densely crowded Pareto front in the very end. One more question, then, Thomas. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. Since the mutations are applied to each of the architectures, uh, they are randomly applied. Is it not possible that the errors increase locally after those mutations? Um, in the previous plot, I think one slide before, um, the errors seem to always decrease. Yeah, so good observation. In, in principle, you cannot guarantee that the error decreases. Um, so it might be that it actually becomes worse. Um, so the thing here to um, distinguish between is that um, there are two types of errors. One is the training error and one is the validation error. And you would use the, the training error, which relates to the training data, to actually optimize the weights. And then you will use the validation error or on, based on the validation data to actually choose what's, what's the best architecture. And so, of course, what could happen is that, uh, well, first of all, you just train and what you did just made, uh, made the architecture worse and then you just have a worse training error than before. Um, another scenario would be that, well, maybe your, your training error um, increase, uh, sorry, it decreases, so you get a better architecture, but actually on the, on the validation error, that's not true anymore. So you somewhat um, overfit to, to your training data. Then you would realize this um, by looking at the validation data. Um, but in, in any case, um, so in this plot here, what you do is you only choose the best networks based on validation error, and this is only choosing the validation error. So by design of the method, this, this fronts can only improve over time. But notice this is still different from the actual test data do you have, that you have to eventually evaluate on. So on the test data, this is not guaranteed to happen anymore. And there it could actually be that you also overfit your validation error, and then these fronts get worse at some point. That, that might happen. But in, in the method itself, we of course don't use the test data and we, we just choose the best architectures based on validation error. And that's why these, these fronts are only improving. There will also be networks that have both like a worse validation, but also worse training error. But these, these networks, which are just worse, they are just not shown in, in this figure. So this, this figure is just showing the, the best networks based on the validation error. Okay. So going on, we again use these network morphisms to yeah, avoid training from scratch as before. Um, there's one problem with these network morphisms and that is that they only increase the size of your network. Um, so you just add layers, you add filters and so on because otherwise you cannot guarantee that you have this, this identity property. So what we also did in this paper is we um, yeah, propose something that we call approximate network morphisms that will also allow you shrinking your networks you cannot guarantee that the performance stays the same then, but um, it, it will roughly stay the same. And yeah, by that, this is much more suitable for this multi-objective use case, because, well, if you just have mutations that make networks bigger, then this is, of course, be counterproductive if you're also looking for very small and very efficient architectures. Okay. By the way, there's also this, this blog post. There's this link here in the top right corner where you can read this up and where you also have some, some more details. Okay. Good, good. So there's one more slide with details. I will, I think I will skip that for time reasons, but you can also find the explanation in, in the blog post. So this slide is just explaining how exactly the sampling process is done based on, on the cheap and expensive objectives. 
but yeah, I will rather use some some remaining minutes to, to show you some results. And so what you can see here is the performance of our methods in red um, compared to NASNet and MobileNet. So NASNet is another neural architecture search method, which uses reinforcement learning, um, it, which is just optimizing for a single objective. And it's also 50 times more expensive than what we do because it's just black box and it doesn't use this network of business. And then we are comparing to MobileNet v2, which was by the time like a, the prime example for a very efficient architecture that was designed by, by humans. And so here in this plot, you can see three objectives that we are all optimizing for, and we also optimize for even more. Um, on the y-axis, you can always see the test error. Of course, we are optimizing for validation error, non test, um, but we are optimizing for the error. And then on the y-axis, you can see the number of parameters, for example, and the latency. And there are a few interesting things here. Um, first, if you look at the number of parameters versus error plot, then you can see that in this range of, say, like, yeah, around a million and up to 10 million, all these methods, they, they pretty much perform the same. And that's not so surprising because both NASNet and MobileNet, they were somewhat designed to perform very well in this regime. And also with our method, we, we can, can't really improve up on this. But where, where it gets more interesting is when you look at this very small parameter regime, um, then, then you come to an area where these methods are not really optimized for, and they are also much less flexible than what the output of Lemonade is. Um, because for NASNet and MobileNet, you basically just have two hyperparameters, um, which are kind of controlling the depth and the number of filters um, to kind of scale these models down. And then here in the slow parameter regime, you can really see that there are some improvements by our method because we are explicitly also optimizing for this parameter regime and they are not. What's also interesting is if you look at latency, well, compared to MobileNet, you can kind of see the same pattern. And then compared to NASNet, um, you can see that NASNet is performing really, really poorly when it comes to latency. And that's, again, very easy to explain. If you look into NASNet, then you can see that it was designed to have very few flops and very few parameters. And that's somewhat achieved by having um, very small layers with like very few parameters. But also to kind of compensate for that, they have like hundreds of layers in the engineering the network architecture. And that gives you like this trade-off um, and that increases the latency a lot um, because you can't really leverage the, the parallel computation on, on GPUs and because of that it has like a very poor latency. Again, our method is optimizing for all these all these objectives and all these ranges at the same time. So overall you get uh, quite a lot of improvements in um, yeah, some of the areas where, where other methods are well, not, not aiming for to be good at. Yeah. Okay, did I want to show. Yeah. Thomas, sorry, did you compare also with MNASNet, which seems to be this uh, primary yeah. kind for yeah. mobile apps? Yeah. yeah, so, so MNASNet came out after this paper, so we didn't compare to that yet. Um, I'm not sure if they. It's, it's a similar approach, and um, so it's it's not truly multi objective, I would say. What they do is they, they scalarize the objective function, so rather than optimizing for all the dimensions, uh, independently, um, what they do is they just have one objective function, which is like a weighted sum or a weighted product of different objective functions. Yeah? So that, that's somewhat a different approach, which has some, some pros, but also some, some cons. Okay. The last thing I briefly want to mention is um, there was another follow-up paper where we also looked at um, the robustness of neural networks, um, th and this might actually relate to safety as well. And what we did here is we looked into robustness with respect to hardware faults. So this is not adversarial robustness or so on, but really robustness with respect to hardware faults. Um, so maybe very interesting for you. And what we did here is we had some simulation experiments where we basically randomly flipped some activate bits in the activation functions and as like a measure for robustness. And then we came up with an objective function, which is actually measuring this robustness. And we also plugged this into our method and optimized for that. And then you can see here in, in green our method and again, MobileNet and NASNet as competitors. If you directly optimize for this robustness, you actually also get networks which are much more robust to, than the, these other methods. Um, and we look into this by on the x-axis looking at yeah the, the error rate of the bits, and then on the y-axis we measured how many of the classification output changes. So uh, lower is better. Okay. Just to conclude, um, so first thing is I didn't really touch on that here, but there has be, really been a lot of progress in, in the last couple of years, and um, this is re uh, really a hyped field of research right now. And I think you can expect a lot in, in the coming years. Um, so the first, the second thing then would be that 
but it's not that expensive anymore. And by now, I would say everyone who has like a few GPUs could could afford to try these methods. So so don't be afraid there. And the last thing, which is probably especially interesting for this community, is that um, multi-objective is really something that came to the interest of many people. And and by now, um, this is, you can find this in many papers, and many pe people are interested in, th in this. And um, so if you're interested in kind of this this specific applications, then um, yeah, there's a high chance that there is also some some papers that are very interesting for that. Okay, and with that, I'm at my final talk. So. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for having me here again. And I'm happy to take some more questions. Thank you, Thomas. There is a couple of questions. Um, one is quite general about the applicability of neural architecture search. So um, to which kind of problems can this be applied, specifically NLP or any other um, machine learning or deep learning problems? Yeah. Yeah, so I didn't really mention that. Um, so everything I showed you here today was just for, for computer vision problems and for image classification and in, in, in specifically. Um, most, most work really focused on computer vision and image classification, but by now there's also a lot of work on semantic segmentation and object detection, but really like 80, 90% is probably computer vision problems. But there are also some papers on um, NFP, for example, on, on time series data and so on. Um, but these papers are much more rare, but you can find them if you if you look for them, and I, I would also expect that there will be much more in the, in the future. Okay, one more. Uh, what is the benefit of optimizing just parameters without considering performance? So it seems counterintuitive uh, in that the model would always choose fewer parameters if that is the objective. Yes, so um, you will always have to straight up, yeah, and you will, uh, let me go back to the slides. Um, if you look at these, these curves again, um, then of course you will have some, some networks that basically are the optimum for uh, minimizing number of parameters. And this will always be some trivial solutions which are not really interesting for you in practice probably. Um, but you will also have all these intermediate solutions. Say you have some optimal architectures with maximum 100,000 parameters with a million parameters, um, everything in between. Um, so these very extremes are probably not, not that interesting. And of course, the trivial solution would always be like a network with zero parameters, which doesn't do anything useful. But in, in between, you will have something that, that can be very helpful. Yeah? And seeing these curves can, can also help, see, help seeing the trade-off here. Yeah? So, so maybe you're also in a de decision where you are not sure yet whether you can afford like 100,000 parameters or 200,000 parameters, um, but you can just could use this method and then you can, after running the method, you could see, okay, for 100,000 parameters, I get this performance, but for 200,000 parameters, I get that performance. So. Okay, thank you. Um, mainly because of time, I think we should uh, move on for today. If there is any um, question remaining, we will follow up in the, in the forum. So if you go to the next slide, please. Do, yeah, do we want to, so you want to go on? Yeah. Yes, the poll is already running. Yeah, so once again, we need to thank the TinyML Talk sponsors, ARM, Deep Light, Edge Impulse, Maxim Integrated, Kitso, Reality AI, and Syncense. And as you know, additional sponsorship opportunities are, are possible. So just contact Olga at tinyml.org. Next slide. Thank you. So uh, this um, ARM is the Software and Hardware Foundation for TinyML. DeepLight uh, uses AI to make other AI faster, smaller, and more power efficient. Um, Edge Impulse uh, is the TinyML for all developers. Maxim integrated with the new Max 78000 implements AI inferences at over 100x lower energy than other embedded options. Kicho uh, is an automated machine learning platform that builds tiny ML solutions for the edge using sensor data. Reality AI is meant for building products. And SynSense uh, builds ultra low power sensing and inferencing uh, hardware for embedded mobile and edge devices. 
One last reminder uh, about the next talk. Uh, so um, Tuesday next week at 8 a.m. Pacific time or 5 uh, in the afternoon in, in Central Europe time, uh, Vijay Janap already, associate professor from Harvard University, will be presenting the tiny ML birth. And with this, we are concluding. If you joined live, uh, you can stay in the call uh, for a while. So after the recording gets stopped, uh, we will enable the microphones and we can have an uh, informal talk. We can have some networking opportunities. Uh, otherwise, thank you very much for um, joining us and have a good day. Bye bye.